Hello and thank you for joining us. This is our Bible class for Sunday, June the 28th, and we're glad you are here with us online. We would like to invite you to be with us at 1030 for our worship service on, on Sundays in person. We're glad to be back together in the auditorium, and we'd love to have you come be with us for that. In our Bible class, we've been studying John's gospel as John leads us to believe. That's his whole point in writing this gospel. He said, so that we would come to know and believe that Jesus is the Christ. And we left off last week at the end of John chapter 6. So this week we'll pick up in chapter 7 with a really interesting story. Verse 1 says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. After these things tells us there's a period of time here that we're not specified exactly how long it is. But Jesus continues to stay in Galilee. And we know it's going to be about six months at least before he shows up in Jerusalem. And that would allow for quite a bit of time in what we read in some of the other Gospels that happens that John doesn't record for us, whether that's the events of Matthew 15 through 18 or Mark 7 through 9 or Luke chapter 9. Uh, that would be the, the healing of the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman uh, in the land of Tyre and Sidon, the, the deaf and dumb man in Decapolis, the feeding of the 4,000, the transfiguration, plus lots of conversations that John doesn't tell us about. All of that happens during this time, and John kind of says, I want to get to something that happens next. John is moving toward those signs and those symbols. And, and so he said, after these things, Jesus stayed in Galilee for a while. He said he couldn't stay in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Galilee was that northernmost province there, and Herod Antipas was the ruler over that, and that gave Jesus a little bit of protection from those Jerusalem Jews. And when he talks about the Jews, that's really who he means. This is the, the Jewish leaders, the, the Jews that we met back in chapter 5 that, that were opposing him, the members of the establishment that were hostile to him. And verse 2 says, Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacles was at hand. For the Jews, there were three main feasts that they celebrated each year in which all the men were expected to come to Jerusalem. And this is one of those three great feasts. Originally, it was called the Feast of Ingathering. It celebrated the harvest when the first harvest came in. But, but it came to be known as the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths because as part of this celebration, the Jews would go out and build these small huts and they would live kind of in their front yard. We might talk about camping out in your front yard. They would live in their front yard and that would remind them of their time in the wilderness when God provided for them. So this feast is always about the providence of God. First, of how he provided for them in the wilderness when they were living in booths or temporal, uh, tabernacles or tents. They, they lived in those temporary shelters. And then once they got to the land, they celebrated as the Feast of Harvest because that marked the time when God had provided another year of produce for them. And so this is a time to celebrate what God has done for them. It is, according to Old Testament re or to uh, historical references, the greatest of the three feasts. Josephus says it was especially sacred and important. It was certainly the most popular of all of them because it was kind of a, a time of thanksgiving, a time that was celebrated with food and with, with festivals. But Jesus has been staying away from Jerusalem, and now the Feast of Tabernacles has come. And so he's not going to be able to stay away any longer. The Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. And verse 3 tells us something interesting. It says, His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. We meet this group that's called his brothers. We can only assume that these are the male children of Mary and Joseph. We know from other references that Jesus had brothers and sisters. At least they were half-brothers and sisters. We are we, Four different brothers are mentioned in the Gospels. James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And we also have sisters that are mentioned. So including Jesus, there would be at least seven children in the household. And, and now here his younger brothers come to him and, and they have a, a, a challenge for him. They said, we want you to go into Judea so that your disciples can see the works. Now, disciples here can't mean those 12 men. They were with him. But they referred to disciples in that broader sense, your followers, your students, those who like you. Jesus, your reputation is growing. You need to head to Jerusalem. You need to go down to Judea so that all your followers can see you. There's a couple of possibilities here. Remember at the end of John chapter 6, when Jesus had given that hard teaching, and from that point on, many folks unfollowed Jesus. They walked away from their faith. 
perhaps the, the brothers are saying, here's a way to regain some of the followers you've lost, Jesus. Here's a way to build back that momentum. You know, you're way up here in the northern fringes. Let's head back down to the really stronghold of Judaism. Let's go to Jerusalem, the capital city for the Jews. Or more likely, they meant, you know, if you're ever going to succeed in this, if you want people to really believe that you're the Son of God, that your mission is divinely sanctioned, you're going to have to do that in Jerusalem. You can't do it up here in Galilee. And that kind of seems more likely their meaning based on what else they said. So they tell him, depart from here, go into Judea, that your, work, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. And in verse 4, they said, for no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. Jesus, if you want a good reputation, you can't be working out here on the fringes of Judaism. You can't be working up here in Galilee. You're going to have to go into the heart of the people. And we know this. We're going to read there in verse 5. It says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. This is not from a statement of faith from them, a position of faith. This is not them advising Jesus what they think is best so much as it almost is a challenge. And I'm reminded of what the devil said to Jesus there when he tempted him. He brought him up to the pinnacle of the temple and he said, throw yourself down. Let everybody see who you are. Do it right in the middle of everybody there on the temple. The brothers kind of be, seem to be saying the same thing. They don't accept his claims to be the Messiah. They don't understand who he really is. And they say, you know what, if you want people to believe in you, and maybe by extrapolation there, if you want us to believe in you, go prove it. Go prove it in the heart of everywhere. It was inconceivable that somebody who wanted to be known would try and stay in the secret, stay in the shadows. And Galilee was just a long way from anything that, that they could see. And so was, they said, whoever wants to do this, he seeks to be known openly, the Bible says. The word there, openly, in parasia, it, it literally means in boldness. Show some courage, Jesus. And if you want to be known, then, then show up. Do it publicly, some translations say. This is an attack against Jesus' modesty that he's shown. Perhaps, they said, the Judeans would accept him even if the Galileans, and in particular his own family, would not. You know, we don't believe you. The folks up here don't believe you. But head down to Judea. See if they believe you. And the brothers said, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now that surely displays an interesting idea for them. Their idea of the world was all the Jews. Their idea of the world was Jerusalem. Earlier in John chapter 3, John had said, God so loved the world. And, and there when John uses the word, he doesn't mean the Jews in Jerusalem. He means the world. All of us, everyone, everywhere. And they say, show yourself to the world. They simply mean show yourself to all the Jews. All the righteous folks who will be there for the Feast of Tabernacles. Show yourself to them. Their challenge comes from a position of disbelief and misunderstanding. And we know that they, John says they weren't believing in him. That's confirmed in the other Gospels as well. Only after Jesus' resurrection does his family member, do his brothers and sisters come to believe in him. We find in Acts chapter 1 that his brothers are among the disciples now. But it takes that point before they come to faith. John chapter or In verse 6 of John 7, Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Jesus gives this same answer that he gave to his mother in Cana at the wedding feast there. My hour is not yet come. Here he says, my time is not yet come. This is not the right time for me. This is not the right place for me. And he says something interesting for us to understand a right time and a wrong time. Jesus said, this is not the right time for me, but your time is always ready. Your time doesn't matter. You can go to the feast whenever you want. You can go now. In fact, that's what he's going to tell them. Go ahead, get there early. Show up now. It doesn't really matter when you get there. What he means is you're not on a schedule. You're not following a plan. You can go whenever you want. There's no consequence to your decision. But he says, my time matters. I'm on a schedule. I'm following God's plan. He says, my time has not yet come. And so Jesus says, you know what, to his brothers, your situation is very different from me. Y'all go whenever you want. But I can't go just yet. The exact day they arrived was of little consequence. One time was as good as another. But for Jesus, there's a plan to all of this. And we're reminded again of the wisdom and providence of God. And he says, my time, my kairos is the Greek word there. It means the suitable time. It refers to a point in time. It's not right for me to go just yet. And then he explains it. He says, verse 7, the world can't hate you, but it hates me. 
by which he, he really means there. The, the brothers said, show yourself to the world. And they meant show yourself to everyone who matters in a religious sense. But now Jesus uses the word world in a broader sense, the world that belongs to Satan. And he says, the world can't hate you. That's interesting. He, he said, you know, you're already part of it. You're, you're part of this system. Satan's not after you, but he's after me. There's a war going on with me, and I, I've got to fight this battle. The world can't hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Jesus said, I point out the evil in the world, and so I, I have a mission. I, I've got a job to do. His brothers didn't think in spiritual terms. They were only looking at physical matters. And therefore, any time would do for them to go to the feast. But Jesus said, I have a mission. And in a mission, timing is everything. And I've got to do this just right. And so he says in verse 8, you go up to this feast. And the you is emphatic. Y'all go on, he says. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast. Jesus has said, my time is not here yet. It's not the right time for me. He says, you go on. I won't come just yet. Some translations say, I'm not going. And certainly he would say, you go up, I'm not going. And the idea of, I'm not going with you. I'm not going at your time. I'm not going up to the feast the way you want me to go. I'm not going up to the feast until the Father instructs me to do so. I'm not going to go up at the time or the place or the manner that you would like. Later, we'll see Jesus enter Jerusalem to crowds of people. But he's not ready to do that just yet. And so he says, you go on up. To this feast, I'm not yet going, for my time has not yet fully come. He has rejected his brother's idea, both to the time and the manner and motive of his visit for the feast. And so it says, when he'd said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. They go on down to Jerusalem. Jesus stays there. And it's interesting, verse 10 then tells us, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. So after his brothers go up, Jesus comes along behind him again. That's why Jesus is not saying, I'm not going. He just means, I'm not going yet. I'm not going in the way you want. I'm not going right now in the manner and motive that you have. But later, when the time is right, he does go. And after his brothers have left Galilee, Jesus goes up, gone up and he leaves Galilee. And by the way, if you're tracking Jesus' ministry, this is the last time that he leaves Galilee. And it's recorded anyway. And Jesus goes on up to the feast. Presumably he takes the twelve with him. And it says that they, they went not openly, but as it were in secret. Jesus isn't keeping it a secret. He's going to teach openly. He's not hiding. He's simply purposely not drawing attention to himself. And, and so he quietly slipped into the city. No fanfare. His movements, his teachings are very public after his arrival. Jesus isn't afraid of the crowd. He simply knew that he had a mission and he was on a timetable. And this was not quite the right time to draw a crowd. Jesus shows us over and over again. He is determined to surrender to the Father's will. Verse 11 says, Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he's good. Others said no. On the contrary, he deceives the people. We meet lots of folks here. We're going to see the crowd. We're going to see the Jews. In a little bit, we're going to see the crowds, plural. When we talk about the Jews here, the phrase Jews is contrasted with the crowd. So we know we're talking about those Jewish authorities. And so as we begin verse 11, the Jews sought him at the feast. They said, where is he? The Jews were looking for him. The Pharisees, the rulers, the chief priests, they remembered the last time Jesus was in Jerusalem. That's when he healed a lame man on the Sabbath. That's when they had decided, you know what, he's got to go. The Jewish leaders were expecting that Jesus would come. They were expecting he'd leave Galilee. He'd step out from under the protection of Herod Antipas there. That he would come to the feast. And based, basic to their motivation was this realization. If we let him get away with this claim to be the Messiah, everybody's going to follow him. We can't let him keep saying this about being the Son of God. We've got to stand up to him. And, and so they sought him at the feast. They were expecting him there. And they, they wanted to know. They, were, they said, where is he? In other words, they're kind of asking people, where is he? They're expecting people to inform on him. Verse 12 says, there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Your Bible may say grumbling there. It's not quite the negative, hostile connotation you would normally think. It's more that there is whispering. This is said quietly. We're going to find out the people are still very afraid. And so there's this discussion that goes on. And the crowd, these are the Jews who aren't the religious authorities. And the crowd is beginning to say, you know what? Some of them said he's a good man. He's not a bad person. Look at what he does. Look at what he says. He's a good 
person. And others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives people. In other words, he only looks to be good. Notice, by the way, both groups of people agree that Jesus gives the appearance of a good person. Some said it was genuine. Some said it was an, that he was an imposter. But that he was leading people astray. He deceives people. Certainly the message that the Jewish leaders were putting out was that Jesus was a hypocrite and an imposter. And the people there, the idea he deceives people, it would mean he deceives other people. You know, we never think that we are the ones being deceived. But no, he deceives those, those poor, ignorant masses, the uneducated folks. He deceives them. Verse 13 tells us, however, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Whatever your opinion, good or bad, Jesus was not a topic to be discussed openly and loudly in public. Instead, you kept it very quiet. You whispered about it because there was great fear of what the Jews would do. We find out in verse 14, now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. The middle could mean exactly that, that central day, the fourth day of a seven-day feast. Perhaps that's what it means. Or perhaps it simply means somewhere between the first day when his brothers went and the last day, sometime in there, he was at the feast. And, and he goes up into the temple. This is something very open and obvious and public. Until now, Jesus' words have been uh, mainly in response. But now we read that he goes up to the temple for the purpose of teaching. Jesus is initiating this discussion. And in John's gospel, this is the first time we've seen him do that. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he went to Jerusalem and declared himself openly when he cleansed the temple. His next visit was when he healed the lame man on the Sabbath day and created quite a stir. That's when the Jews became so hostile to him. This time, there's no great miraculous deed. There's no cleansing of the temple, running everybody out. This time, he simply begins to teach. And that was a big change for some folks. These Jewish Jews, these Jerusalem Jews, they'd never heard him expound the scriptures. They'd seen him do miracles. They'd seen him get angry and run the money changers out. But now he simply begins to teach about the word of God. And so verse 15 says, the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters having never studied? They don't mean how does he read. They really mean how does he know what all these words mean? He taught as one with authority, we read elsewhere. They were surprised by his mastery of the scriptures. He hadn't gone to any of their schools. He hadn't trained under any of their rabbis. And yet without ever having studied in their schools, he's mastered the scriptures. They weren't astonished, again, at his skills. They were really astonished that he could have such knowledge without having attended the, one of the proper schools. And, and I'm reminded of what's going to happen later. Peter and John, after the church begins, will be called in to testify before the Sanhedrin. And in Acts chapter 4, the Sanhedrin are going to be amazed because they said these are uneducated, untrained men. And they took note that they had been with Jesus. And so they marveled at him saying, how do you know all this? Where do you get this? And the word marvel might have a positive connotation. And yet here it really is a negative one. They're offended that Jesus would presume to teach with such authority when he didn't go to any of the right schools. And so in verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Here Jesus calls his message doctrine or teaching. He says, what I'm teaching, it's not mine. And that's important. This is the only time Jesus calls his message doctrine. He says, my teaching, and he's addressing the professional teachers. So he said to all you teachers, I want you to know what I teach is not mine. If others drew their uh, authority from what they had learned in the writings, from what they had learned in their rabbi, from their rabbis, Jesus says, I, I don't get it from that. My doctrine is not mine. It's him who sent me. I get mine straight from God. The way in which Jesus responded shows that, that he was that master teacher as well as a master responder. He understands what they're saying and he responds immediately to them. He had told these rabbis, if he had said his teaching was his own, that, that, you know, hey, this is just what I figured out with no sanction, they would have ridiculed him and he would have been viewed as a heretic. But he said, it doesn't originate with me. It comes straight from the Lord. And so when Jesus wants people to understand that, he says, you know, godly teaching is going to have the right attitude. Look at what he says. Verse 17, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Jesus links submission to God with knowledge of the Bible. 
He said, if you want to, to know his will, if you desire to know his will, it's not achieved by some theological debate. It's not achieved by knowing letters, as they would say. You can't treat God's will as a topic to be analyzed. It comes from submitting to God. <clears throat> Excuse me. This statement that, that links that submission with knowledge, Jesus called upon everyone to make that faith commitment. You don't have to go to school and learn all this. You just need to commit to knowing God and you'll know his will to make that faith commitment. But we also see that, that a right motivation is required for evaluating Jesus' teaching. He says in verse 18, He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Jesus said it matters why you're doing this. If you're seeking your own glory, if you're out to do it to do this just to bring glory to yourself, you'll miss the message. But if you seek to glorify God, then you'll find truth. If you seek to glorify God, no unrighteousness will be found in him. Jesus is drawing a distinction between that selfish, egocentric person who tries to promote himself and the one who works to promote the purposes and the plan of God. Jesus' whole mission was to speak the words that had been given to him. And to do the works that were given to him to do. And so to convince others to believe in him and to give glory to God. And then Jesus uses an argument they would understand. Verse 19, did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Jesus calls on Moses. He said, Moses gave you the law. Moses was your law giver. And the way he says it, did not Moses give you the law? It's like certainly Moses gave you the law. And yet Jesus said, none of you carries out the law. Stephen is going to repeat that charge in Acts chapter 7, right before he's stoned. Paul is going to tell the same truth. None of us keep the law as we should. And having received the law is no guarantee of having God's favor. It's in keeping it. And in support of his statement, Jesus said, why do you seek to kill me? The word there is murder. Jesus said, look, you don't keep the law. There's a commandment that says you shall not kill. You shall not commit murder. And yet you seek to murder me. And so Jesus is calling out their hypocrisy. In spite of all their esteem for the law and, oh, we love Moses and we love the law, they were seeking to kill Jesus in violation of the law. And as Jesus says that, the people reach a conclusion. Verse 20, the people answered and said, you have a demon. The idea of demon possession is rather foreign to us today. For them, what they attributed to demon possession was a broad range of what we might call mental illness today. Certainly, demon possession is real in the New Testament, and we see Jesus casting out demons. But the way they would identify a demon-possessed person is to say, you're crazy. You're, you're talking and doing things that are crazy. And here, Jesus demonstrates what they take to be paranoia. And so they say, you have a demon. You're crazy. Who's seeking to kill you? They look around and they say, Jesus, you're standing out here in the open. You're perfectly safe. And he says, somebody's trying to kill me. Somebody's after me. And they said, you're paranoid, Jesus. And, and so they, they tell him, and this is the crowd again. This is the people. This would be the travelers that were there. Some of them didn't know their history. They didn't know all that had happened with Jesus and the Jews. Some of them, this was some of their first exposure to Jesus. And as best they could determine, nobody was actively seeking to kill Jesus right then. And so the crowd thought that Jesus had some mental illness. Who is trying to kill you? Who's seeking to kill you? From their perspective, only someone who's mentally disturbed would harbor such suspicions. And Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you all marvel he doesn't tell us what one work he's referring to john has already told us about some miracles john also tells us there were a lot more miracles that we didn't write down so which one is jesus referring to almost certainly he's referring to the healing of the man who had been lame for 38 years we read about that in john chapter 5 it happened on the sabbath and jesus is saying you know what i did one work and you marvel they didn't marvel because he healed a lame man they marveled because he did it on the Sabbath. It was the circumstances, not the miracle, that had caught their attention. The miracle that, that had caused them to be astonished that he would dare to tell a man to carry his bed on the Sabbath day and violate their laws. Jesus said, I did one work and you all marvel. And then he goes back to Moses and he said, Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. Jesus said in the law of Moses, circumcision was prescribed for all Jewish people. And Jesus says Moses 
prescribed that circumcision even on the Sabbath. And, and Jesus is going to say that he did this for a reason, so that you could see exactly what I'm doing. And John makes sure we understand circumcision didn't come from Moses. It goes all the way back to Abraham. It was older than Moses. But the right that had been instituted in Abraham's day well, it was codified in the law of Moses. And Moses said, on the eighth day, you practice circumcision for every one of your sons. And Jesus said, if that eighth day falls on a Sabbath when work is prohibited, you go ahead and circumcise anyway. It creates this dilemma. Here's the Sabbath, a day of rest, but here's a commandment for circumcision, and you have to choose which one will you obey. And he says, on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. So, so if your son is born and, and the day for circumcision comes up on a Saturday, you do it anyway. You break the Sabbath law because the Jews said that, circum, that circumcision was more important than keeping the Sabbath. The sign of the covenant was more important than the day of rest. And Jesus says in verse 23, If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Jesus said, you can work on one body part, you, you can focus on one small act, and I healed the whole man. You can focus on one sign of the covenant, and I restored a son of the covenant. And if you can do that on the Sabbath, then why couldn't you do an act of mercy? Jesus said, why would you be angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? And then in verse 24, he says, do not judge according to appearance. They were looking on the outward. Jesus is saying, you know what, you're, you're judging by appearance, you're judging wrongfully, you've wrongfully judged me. You've wrongfully judged this situation. Don't judge based on appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Literally, when he says don't judge, he says stop judging, quit judging by appearance. They were judging wrongly. And then he says judge with righteous judgment. There is a right way to judge. It is to judge according to God's standards, not your traditions, not your interpretations, but judge with a righteous standard. Now, some have looked at what Jesus said in Matthew 7, where he says, do not judge. And here he says, judge. And they've said, oh, see, Jesus contradicts himself. Not at all. There's no inconsistency. Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, do not judge. He's dealing with those capricious judgments that he tells them to stop doing here, those appearance-based judgments. Here he's dealing with a righteous judgment. And Jesus said you ought to judge things the way God judges things. You ought to look at things the way God looks at things. Don't judge according to appearance, but judge with a right, a godly judgment. This would be the last word in the debate that it, that it started all the way back in the healing of that lame man there by the pool at Bethesda. And Jesus said, you need to fix how you see this. You need to correct your eyes here. You're judging based on appearance and you need to see something deeper. You need to see what's right and what's wrong. You need to understand the role of mercy and grace even on the Sabbath. And so Jesus isn't saying, well, just break the Sabbath. The Sabbath doesn't matter. But he does say you need to understand what God really wants. And God always desires mercy over sacrifice. And so when you get an opportunity to, to do good, to heal a whole person, you take it no matter what day it is, no matter what the other circumstances are. That's how you judge with a righteous judgment. In verse 25, we'll pick up there next week as we continue to look at this. People begin to say, well, wait a minute, we're not sure who you are. Could this really be the Christ? Is this the one they're trying to kill or is this the Son of God? And they begin to discuss this and Jesus is going to help them to reach some conclusions there as well. Thank you so much for joining us for this study. Let's wrap up this time together with a word of prayer. Almighty God, Father, we are thankful for the Bible, for the chance to study it. Thankful for your word and your will. Thankful for your plan that always has a, a right time. And God, we pray that we will seek to be in the right time, to do the right thing in the right place at the right time for your word. But God, we're also so grateful that as much as you have shown us your plan, you've also shown us your heart. And we pray that you would help us to have a heart like yours, to love like you, to seek to do justice and mercy, to show grace like you do. God, help us to be more like you each and every day. Thank you for the chance we've had to study today. May it enrich our lives and help us to live out our faith more strongly every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.